Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ABL Group's Maritime Market Briefing for April 2023. Uh, my name is Mark McGurran, and I'm the Global Managing Director for Maritime here at ABL. Uh, thank you all for coming, those of you who are in the room. Uh, I understand it wasn't easy this morning, both Liverpool Street and Waterloo are facing problems, so we appreciate you making the effort. Uh, Paul Hill, our uh, Group Technical Director, was meant to be giving the presentation today, but he's been sent off on a, on a rather interesting survey down in Falmouth, so perhaps we'll hear about that in next month's case reports. Um, our briefing this morning is accredited um, by the Chartered Insurance Institute and delegates can claim up to one CPD hour for your participation. We will therefore keep a record of those of you in the room today and those of you logging on online. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you sign in with the team on the desk outside after the briefing so you can receive our follow-up emails uh, and if you need it, CPD accreditation. I'm delighted to introduce our technical presenters today. Um, Roman graduated from the Californian Maritime Academy and Naval Postgraduate School and started his career in the United States Navy studying nuclear power. Roman was also an assistant professor at the Californian Maritime Academy and a port engineer at Foss Maritime Academy and has been a surveyor for the last ten and a half years and has come over from his, his West Coast location in the States. And following uh, Roman, Paloma will be giving the case reports. Paloma is a naval architect that graduated from the University of Southampton. She completed the ABL engineer development scheme as part of ABL's renewables MWS system, working on offshore renewable projects such as Viking Link Interconnector, Arcadis Wind and Sophia Wind Farm. Please note the usual caveats apply, Chatham House rules apply, and please remember that the information contained in these presentations and any opinions or comments expressed are those of the presenters and not necessarily those of ABL. At the end of today's briefing, can we please ask everyone to take a few minutes out of their time to complete the online survey? This is very critical for us to ensure that our CPT accreditation status remains and allows us to continue to offer one CPT point per briefing. It also means, of course, we can actively look at bettering our services and how we can improve our briefings to match your requirements. You can use this QR code for those of you who know how to do such things, um, or we can also send you find a link in our follow up email. And finally, before I hand over to Roman, we would ask you to give a few moments thought to the seafaring men and women at sea today. There are a multitude of factors going on in the world which impact adversely the lives and conditions of seafarers, including working longer than they are meant to due to crew change issues. Many of our own colleagues come from seafaring backgrounds, so crew welfare is a cause that is very close to our hearts here at ABL. As such, ABL Group is a signatory to the Neptune Declaration, which has undoubtedly played a part in some recent improvements that have occurred. Please take a moment to take a look at this and perhaps consider getting your own company to sign up to become a signatory. And with that, I shall pass over to Roman. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, it's been, I think, 2019 was the last time I was in London. So it's actually nice to see the world moving again. Um, Today, I wanted to talk about labor shortages in Western United States and how this and other issues affect marine insurance. Um, and as an FYI, when I pitched it, labor was spelled without the U, how we do it in America. <laughs> there we go. Um, as our maritime market briefings are CPD accredited, there's important criteria to run through our learning objectives for today. <clears throat> you will be able to explain some of the reasons for the lack of labor in U.S. West Coast shipyards. Uh, you will be able to describe how steel costing calculations are conducted. You'll, be able, you'll understand the recent increase in shipyard costs around the world and explain causing factors. By the end of the presentation, you'll gain an understanding of shipyard invoicing and be able to discuss common themes. I will also recap these at the end of the presentation. So to start out, I wanted to go through a hypothetical situation. Um, first, know that this is 100% made up. Um, <clears throat> I do know people who had similar situations 
but this is not a real story. Um, no offense is made for any accidental blunders against the crown. Um, <clears throat> and also, this is based on there we go minimum wage for last month. Okay, so let's pretend that you have a cousin named Ian, which is spelled in the proper British way with an extra I. Um, <clears throat> and Ian lives less than a mile from Exeter Cathedral. And he works as a tour guide um, for minimum wage at nine eighteen an hour. He loves his job. He's able to make his ends meet, um, barely, but he makes the meet because he inherited a family home. Things are going great. He works eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, but he wants more out of life. And while looking for jobs nearby, someone sends him an advertisement for a job building luxury yachts. So he looks at Indeed.com for higher paying jobs nearby and sees what this one for Sunseeker. Uh, Sunseeker has around 2,000 employees manufacturing luxury performance motor yachts. Uh, originally named Pool Power Boats, which is an important factor in our discussion. Uh, <clears throat> they produce 150 boats a year from 38 to 161 feet. <clears throat> and their dedicated design and technology center is located in Pool. So Ian looks at this job, paying six pounds an hour more than he currently makes at the cathedral, and he applies because he's going to learn new skills. Um, they have benefits, <clears throat> um, he's going to get an increased salary, and there's potential for advancement in the company. But the distance from his home is about 80 miles. A two-hour trip driving, or a three-and-a-half to four-hour trip taking public transportation, which is completely out of the question. That's just one way. So Ian does the math, or maths, depending on who you're talking to again, uh, and realize he's going to be driving 160 miles a day in a car that gets 7.8 miles per liter. His tank holds 57 liters. He's going to be using around 20 liters a day of fuel to get to and from work. So daily fuel cost is 30, just over 30 pounds. And on a daily basis at 15 and a half, he's still taking home 20 extra pounds per day. So it's worth it. Um, <clears throat> he's going to be learning new skills. Uh, he's going to have growth potential at his new job. So he leaves the cathedral for this job. But the manager, who's also one of your cousins, says anytime he wants to come back, you can come back home. Uh, you're always welcome if it doesn't work out. So <clears throat> Ian's got this new job for a couple of years. He's getting really good at it. Uh, he's received a couple of wage increases. Now he's at 16 and a half pounds per hour, which is still six pounds over minimum wage <clears throat> for the same increase of 20 extra pounds per day. But he knows if he stays on board, he's got good chances for advancement um, and even larger wage increases. So he's sticking it out. Think things are going great. Um, <clears throat> he really doesn't mind the two hour drive. Um, he can carpool with other workers occasionally. He has his favorite podcast that he listens to in the morning. And then on the way home, he's got books on tape. Uh, they still do that. Um, he knows exactly when he needs to leave home. He's, he knows where the best coffee stands are. He's doing quite well. Then one day. The king decrees that minimum wage will now be 15 pounds per hour. So let it be written. So let it be done, right? Now, I assume parliament is probably involved, but for our purposes, the fight for 15 has been won. Um, everybody needs a living wage, regardless of your skill level, education, or any attempts to be successful in life. <clears throat> now, Ian goes to his employer and asks about that six pound raise he's going to get <clears throat> because if minimum wage has gone up six pounds then what about me the employer has some options <clears throat> they can increase all employees salaries by five pounds per hour to compete with the increased minimum wage 
<clears throat> but then what are they going to do with the costs of their vessels? They can't maintain the same profit margins and pay people more money. <clears throat> or they can risk doing nothing uh, with employees' wages and then risk losing employees. And for our, our scenario, they choose to do nothing uh, because they're providing these great benefits, um, which are transferable. And then Ian does the math again. He's only making one fifty an hour more than minimum wage. For an eight-hour day, that's only 12 pounds difference in his pocket. But keep in mind, he's paying 30 pounds to drive there. So he's losing money driving to his job that he loves. Um, <clears throat> so he's got to make some, th you know, some choices, right? He's he's losing money, and he's got a job that he can get <clears throat> back at the cathedral. And not only can he walk to work, but he doesn't have to spend thirty pounds on fuel every day. And while he likes the podcast, he can get four hours back every day and then he starts thinking about family life and then the next day he's back at the cathedral and the shipyard has lost a trained worker okay so they could have kept him and all the other workers by increasing their salaries but again what would that have done to the prices of the vessels so why why are these labor shortages happening um so Inflation has had an effect on every aspect of the ship repair industry. Um, I actually had a discussion recently with a person who was upset at their wage increase not matching inflation. But then the question is, well, what does the company you work for have to do with how much money is printed? And if we have deflation or negative inflation, are you going to give money back? I don't plan on doing that. So um, <clears throat> so then how can you be upset with your company over something they can't control, even though they're still... Anyway, that, those are my thoughts. <laughs> um, so in the US, we've actually seen a decline um, in participation in the workforce over the last couple of decades. And some of it has to do with Americans having fewer children. Um, some of it has to do with increased retirements and death. And some of that is even COVID related. Um, so th those are some of the factors that have driven these numbers. Um, vaccine hesitancy. Um, in some areas, it's been an issue. But having worked through the pandemic, one of the industries that did not have much of a loss as far as employees was in the ship repair industry, um, it was this, it was deemed an essential um, service, so trade couldn't be diminished. And so, in fact, considering inflation, the over, U.S. government paid people not to work, um, so there was an increase in people buying things, increase in purchasing, overall increase in trade which may have had a bit to do with some of our supply chain issues. Um, in our example, um, a lot of these items, and this is from Business Insider, um, are apparent. Ian was happy with his job, but now he wants more money. Uh, or did he even like the job? Because now he can have an easier job uh, and take home more money. Uh, did he like the job just for the extra cash or has he been burnt out from the drive to and from work every day? Um, another odd factor is that by July 2022, the U.S. had 11.2 million job openings, but only 5.7 million unemployed workers to fill them. So that's a huge gap between jobs and and people uh so because of covid and you know covid is this area right here um a lot of people suddenly became unemployed um but some had more money coming in than when they were working pre-pandemic and 
I actually have a, a niece who lost her job in 2020. And I asked her if she was looking for a job. And she said, well, I take home $600 a month more than I did when I was working. So why would she look for a job? And how do you argue with that? Like, you are taking home a lot more money. But, you know, you're, you're a great grandchildren. Thank you for it. Um, during the pandemic, there were places I had to travel for work. And for instance, I went one time to um, Seward in Alaska. And the hotels were almost all full. But I couldn't get breakfast because the restaurants didn't have enough staff. So they were practically begging people to come to work. And well, actually, we're going to discuss a little bit more on that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so switching gears, uh, I, I think it's a, an interesting thought exercise. Um, but I wanted to quickly go over uh, you know, some of what you may see in a surveyor's reports. Uh, very, very simple deck barge okay, at the bow, which is this end. Um, is the head log, uh, the stern is the stern log. The front and back of the barges have this diagonal shape here. That's called the rake. Um, and then the compartments inside are either called voids or tanks, depending on who you're talking to and depending on what they're used for. On the top is the deck, obviously. Um, so when we refer to deck plating, that's the section where we're discussing. The side shell is the side of the vessel. Uh, bottom plating is, as you can guess, on the bottom. Bulkheads are the walls between the tanks or voids. Uh, the frames are the side-to-side -side support structure in the vessel. Um, longitudinals are from the front to the back. Uh, and then, so there are under deck, side, and bottom longitudinals and frames. Um, and then on the longitudinals and frames, they're typically L-shaped pieces of steel uh, with the part that's welded to the hull being called the web and then the other part being called the flange. The stanchions are the vertical stiffeners and then diagonals are the diagonals. Um, at the top corner, this is what I refer to as a deck edge. And then at the bottom is the turn of the bilge. That's... That's how I refer to them. Um, so here's a, a barge that I recently inspected. Um, so in this, you can see the side shell uh, and then the turn of the bilge. And there's extra support uh, in that area for contact being made. You can also see pigeonholes. These are used for climbing from a tug or from the dock and then the draft markings. Um, and then Draft markings for American vessels um, are in feet, right? So if you look at the bottom of the two, that is two feet. And at the top of the two, it's two feet, six inches. So all of the, the letter or the numbers are six inches tall. And then the gap between the numbers are another six inches. That makes sense. Okay. Inside, we've got uh pigeonholes you can see the inside structure then we've also got the under deck longitudinals the under deck frames the side longitudinals and then the side frames and then also uh, the shape of these you can see the l shape here and then vertical stanchions diagonals bottom longitudinals frames well here let, let's just say that a ferry has what was referred to on the news as a hard landing. It's an all steel constructed vessel. Um, so while the damage is extensive, it can all be repaired, cropped and renewed. Uh, and this vessel was taken to a shipyard for repairs. Uh, a, the affected section is called a pickle fork. Um, and so just to make everyone feel better, the person who was driving in this vehicle was perfectly fine, but I think he's got a much nicer car now, a courtesy of underwriters. Um, <laughs> so 
repairs that vessel during repairs. Um, as you can see in this picture, all that steel has been removed. And then from this picture, new steel has been is being installed. Um, and and this actually happened at two different shipyards. So the one shipyard built the new structure, and then they placed it on the barge, towed it over to the other shipyard, lifted it with a crane, and then welded it on. Uh, <clears throat> so this is part of a field survey report that I did for it. Um, and it was conducted with representatives of the owners as well as shipyard personnel and we attempted to determine the scope the extent of damage to the vessel um, and the recommended repairs uh, in this case it was a lot based on drawings and estimations and so there's a lot of use of the word approximate and in, in these reports um, and then steel used on normally steel used on vessels is a36 um steel which is carbon steel and the density of it is pretty much always the same so it could be counted on for its properties and in fact classification societies actually have to stamp the steel plate prior to them being installed on the vessels that are classed um a36 is called a36 because it has a minimum yield strength of 36,000 ksi and if you're wondering what a ksi is that is american metric for 36,000 thousand pounds per square inch PSI. Um, and A36 steel weighs 40.8 pounds per square inch for one inch thick square foot for one, uh, one inch thick plate. Now with this information in hand, it's relatively easy to calculate how much the weight of the steel is gonna be. Um, so I put together a spreadsheet so that I can easily calculate how much it's going to cost for the steel. So the information that I need, I need the length of the piece of steel, the weight of the steel, um, and this is in American, so it's in inches and feet, uh, the thickness, and then here I've got a column for what the shape is. So side shell, side longitudinals, frame, frame of the flange, um, the deck, stern plating and if it's stiffeners and so it's basically putting in what are the dimensions of steel we know it's a36 it weighs 40.8 pounds per square foot for one inch plate so well, i can pretty easily calculate the weight which is this column and then i can look at what it's going to cost per pound now in the u.s shipyards vary um on per pound for steel repairs. And I, I've seen places where it, it is four and a half dollars a pound. It's nowhere near where I live. Uh, it used to be counted on that it was about $21 a pound where I live. Um, and But things have gone up recently. Um, in late 2022, there was a barge that I had dry docked for repairs. And these were the quoted rates $27 for the turn of the bilge um, and that $27 is based on you have to go to the vessel measure it out get the proper angle get the proper curve take it somewhere else and shape it and then go back and install it on the vessel um, so this is a large increase in the scope of of what it's going to cost for those that seal to be installed uh, another way of calculating is based on the production rate. So a shipyard in 2020 told me that they expect to weld four and a half pounds per man hour. Um, so at a rate of $80 per hour for the welders, you can calculate the dollars per pound. Um, and this is how the, the shipyard puts their schedule together based on the production rate. Um, so that's going to determine the amount of lay days that the ship that's going to be on on the dock but keep in mind this is only for steel renewal this does not include costs for dry docking the vessel doesn't include costs for cleaning making it safe for hot work staging or anything else uh, so sample invoice for a barge that was dry docked um, and this is quoted at those uh, per pound 
steel prices for the different sections of the barge. Uh, it was docked for steel repairs only. But if you notice, there's nothing on this section that has anything to do with steel repairs. Um, and one of my favorite parts of an invoice these days is the environmental fee, um, which is hard to quantify. Um, there's a shipyard that no longer exists that may have used the environmental fee to say, here's our prices for the shipyard. We haven't raised them at all. There's just an environmental fee that we have to charge you because we're doing our part for the environment. So the cost goes up, but it's separate from your invoice, right? Your regular costs. Um, so on this, you know, we've got costs for the marine chemist, the shipyard competent person. Uh, the chemist is the one who certifies this place safe for hot work, safe for welding, safe for workers to enter, um, cutting with torches and all that. The competent person then verifies that the conditions are the same every morning before work commences. Both of these um, these positions require training. Uh, the marine chemist is a lot more training, but the competent person has to go through courses and refresher courses every couple of years in order to, to stay competent. You have costs for cranes, man lifts, and other equipment utilized to move the steel plates around. You have costs for opening and closing the manholes. And each one is bolted with around 20 to 30 nuts that all have to be taken off and put somewhere safe and then put back on at the end. Uh, environmental tarping. So this is an example, you know, in Seattle, it, it rains a bit. Um, and so if we stop work because it's raining, then how often would we work? So you've got to put plastic sheeting up in order to keep work progressing. Actually, when I, when I was a port engineer in Seattle, I then moved to Southern California. And one day I went to the shipyard where we had a boat on the dry dock. And I got there and nobody was around, not one person. Uh, What's going on? Oh, we don't work in the rain. So that's San Diego, right? <clears throat> so one other thing to notice on this is the lay days. And in this case, lay days are $5,600 per day. Um, and lay days are a cost for the vessel to sit in the dock each day, just sitting there. Um, as the shipyard can't have other vessels in the dock, it's somewhat of an incentive for you to be quick on your repairs. Uh, so if the longer you're there, the more it costs, right? Um, and then all the way on the second page, we have all of our steel prices. So we've gone through a lot of our invoice before we got to the steel price. And again, it's only there for steel repairs. So what has driven shipyard costs up? Um, a lot of the shipyards don't actually own the land that they're on. So they're at the mercy of the owners of the land for the cost of rent. And this is true everywhere, but when you have a business, you have to include these costs and what you bill out to your customers. Uh, as I noted on the invoice, lay days were $5,600 a day. If your steel production rate is four and a quarter pounds per man hour, how long would it take you to crop and renew a 1,000 pound plate of steel? And the quick math says 235 man hours. If you have eight people doing this, it would take three days. But if you have four people doing it, it's going to take six days, right? So all of a sudden, you have to add $16,800 to that invoice just because the vessel's in the dry dock an extra three days. So shipyards that have a shortage of workers, the work is taking longer to complete, and that's driving the costs up just for lay days alone. So 
wages are going up everywhere. Here's a, a receipt from McDonald's in Seattle from the 5th of this month. They're hiring workers. And if you look there, they're starting at $19 an hour to work at McDonald's. But if you also notice, an order of French fries is $4. And you used to be able to get two Big Macs for $2. But a medium French fry is four dollars because you have to pay people nineteen dollars an hour to work at McDonald's in Seattle. So if McDonald's wages go up, then what happens to everything else? Right? Um, you know, in our example with your your fake cousin, uh, it, it is a real problem that has occurred. And I and I know people who have made decisions after the fight for fifteen was won. Um now, granted, they made more money than minimum wage, but do you really want to do all of that, getting dirty and working hard, when I can bag groceries around the corner and and do about the same? That's that's a big question for people uh, that is affecting our line of business. Uh, environmental fees are also an issue. Uh, Shipyards are required to collect rainwater and on the in or in America. And then they're supposed to treat it prior to letting it go into the sewer. Um, so other areas have no issue with this and they blast paint off of vessels right into the water and nobody cares. Uh, but it, in Seattle, if you were to do something like that and you got caught, there would be very steep fees. Um, we have this thing called the Clean Water Act, uh, and you will have severe penalties. Um, and then there's the EPA has the the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit that everybody has to go through. So they're controlling discharges in industrial, municipal, and other facilities. So they have to get permits if their water is going, if your rainwater is going anywhere um, to surface water. So Shipyards have to increase costs because they have to install equipment to treat rainwater in order to protect the waterways. Uh, some shipyards are actually requiring all vendors to submit their invoices to the shipyard instead of to the owners. And when you submit your invoices to the shipyard, what does the shipyard do with them? They have to add on a markup, 10 to 20%. Now, as everyone's salaries have increased, the owners of companies need to charge more for goods and services. So the cost for everything has gone up. Um, for steel plates, we've seen costs go up dramatically. On a case that I'm on, um, the owner's representative was complaining because a few years ago, he bought steel plate at $1,500 for a 10 foot by 20 foot sheet. And he just purchased it for $3,800 for that same sheet, which is a 250% increase in the amount of steel costs. Um, we've seen costs go up for wire used for welding, uh, plastic sheeting used for envir environmental tarping, fasteners, pipe fittings, you name it, the prices have gone up. Um, one of the shipyards I've done work with is expanding their capabilities, which is a great thing, but the pier that they're working at doesn't have electricity out to it yet. So they have to rent giant generators and put them out on the pier. And who's going to pay for that? The people who bring their vessels in to get work done. Um, and then the cost of energy has gone up. Now, if, if you pay attention to this chart, you... In order to not get political, I won't point out that there are certain year ranges where certain political parties are in charge and other year ranges where different political parties are in charge. And some go up in energy prices and some go down. But I won't say anything about that. Um, <clears throat> so ener energy prices have gone up. And as a result of various items included, including issues in Ukraine and, and Russia, 
everybody's paying more for fuel, which is what we're using to power everything. Um, closing one shipyard increases demand for other shipyards, right? Um, which means that if you want to come to my shipyard and I'm the only game in town, I can charge more. Um, and you're more likely to come to my shipyard because you have to weigh the cost of fuel to get to a cheaper shipyard somewhere else. And, it, and I'm the better choice. And, and I've said it from this podium before that anytime a vessel's in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, you have to determine if it's better to tow it back to Seattle or do the work in Dutch Harbor. And usually it's better to tow it to Seattle because the cost to fly people to Dutch Harbor and move things to Dutch Harbor is it's, it's pretty high. Um, shipyards are competing with other high skilled labor jobs. Um, Boeing is a big one in Seattle, but construction companies want workers who know how to handle tools. So these companies are offering positions at a higher wage and now they're competing with the shipyards. And actually I, I spoke with one of the shipyard uh, representatives and he said, yeah, we're, we're losing people to construction companies because there's a big building boom in our area. Um, and then this quote I put in, because I, it, it's kind of an amazing, and I think we can all understand it. You know, we can't hire a truck driver to drive a trash truck for $90,000 a year, but I can get MBAs all day, 60,000 a year. I think we, we can relate. Um, I actually had a former colleague who worked on a cruise ship as a second engineer. And every time he went to the dinners that he was forced to go to, you know, he, he's the guy with the dirty hands that can't get clean. Um, and everybody looks down on him because he's this dirty slob that works on the ship. But he's also earning more money than the people he's sitting at the table with. But he's not going to say anything about that. He'll just, you know, okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, okay. So to finish, let's recap today's learning objectives. Um, you should be able to explain some of the reasons for a lack of labor in U.S. West Coast shipyards. You'll now be able to describe how steel costing calculations are conducted. You should now understand recent increase in shipyard costs around the world and be able to explain causing factors. And you should now understand shipyard invoicing, be able to discuss the common themes. And hopefully these outcomes have been met for those of you in the room and online. And I hope you found this presentation insightful. Uh, do we need to move on? Okay. Oh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to. No, okay. No, no questions online. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Paloma. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. The purpose of this section of the briefing is to keep you updated on some of the recent higher cost incidents that ABL have been involved in and doing so uh, show you or remind you of the sort of incidents and casualties that can happen in the shipping and marine operations. But in case of in case some of you haven't at attended these briefings before, you might be asking, what are these so called case reports? <clears throat> Well, these feature largely, but not exclusively, hauling machinery casualties with estimated costs of repair in excess of $250,000, usually exclu excluding salvage costs. They cover only a subset of the total ABL group caseloads, which of course include many other aspects uh, apart from H&M, typically between 10 and 20% by case numbers. These case reports are also significant um, they're a significant subset of the H&M work, for although they cover only 20 to 25% of the caseloads by number, they cover around 65 to 75% of the H&M ca cases we survey by cost. We should treat the, these with caution, though. Estimated costs are preliminary and subject to further inspections and or investigations. In presenting these case reports for the last month of activity, it's not about attributing blame. We just aim to cover what's happened. We, we won't be giving any de definition, definitive conclusions about course, as many of the cases are still fresh. 
it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. And in many cases, the cause is still under investigation. I've been notified of 14 high cost cases during March and the blue columns in the graph show their proportional distribution by casualty type. Three machinery cases, two structural uh, and contact cases, one each for fire explosion, propulsion, heavy weather, thruster, and stern tube problems, and one crane damage. You can see that there are one capsized case as well, but that was just attended to a motor yacht that was successfully recovered, although very expensive. As always, with such a small sample set, you're bound to have the gaps in the distribution that you see here um, when you compare it to the distribution of the whole year. This, in this case, the whole of 2022, given as the gray columns. Despite the small sample set, you can see that the distribution still reasonably follows what is a year on year, a very consistent trend with more frequent frequently occurring casualty types being populated, at least with the exception of grounding this month. Now here we've added in the distribution of those same 14 cases by their total cost. There's nothing particularly remarkable or exciting about the costs this month. These machinery cases though, are about a third more significant by cost than by number, which goes against the longer term observation where these have historically been a half or to two halves uh, significant by cost. The total estimated cost for the 14 cases is only just over $6 million. And that makes the average cost for March only $440,000. This is a lot lower than the typical annual background expected figures of about $1 million that we have seen in the recent years. As we're three months into the new year, let's have a quick look at the cum cumulative total for the 2023, effectively the first quarter of the year. With three months data, you can see that most of the categories are now populated, apart from the, least, the three least common, which are flooding, ice and pots. But there are nine months still to go. So nothing particularly unusual, yet at least uh, regarding the rate of incidence of the different casualty types. And here we've, we have added in the proportions of the total cumulative costs. The relative cost of the machinery cases is still high compared to the past, where, as I said, we would have expected the, the red column to be only half to two thirds the height of the blue column. Note the peak in the tail shaft seal category this is a result of that very high cost case involving a tail shaft fracture that we saw last month. The average cost for the first quarter is lower than expected, coming, up, coming in at uh, $710,000 compared to the long-term expected average of 1 million. But as I said, there's a lot of the year still to go. Anyway, let's move on to look at some of the, the March cases in more detail. We've selected seven of them, if we have time. Um, and bear in mind that although we say these are March cases, the month generally refers to the first advice when it comes in from our surveyor. So these cases may actually be from the earlier months. First, we have um, this bright, shiny new container ship that has just been undergoing some finishing touches in her building yard when a little mishap occurred while carrying out an inclining test. An inclining test involves releasing the ship from its moorings and allowing her to float free, then moving large weights from one side of the ship to the other and measuring how much the ship heals. The results of this can be used to determine the vertical position of the center of gravity of the ship and everything on board, which is essential piece of information for determining the stability of the ship against capsizing. Although the designers, of course, and the builders will have done the calculations to estimate this during their, um, the design and building stages, it is essential to check that the, the stability booklet that the ship officers will rely on is accurate and reliable. Anyway, in this case, the, weight that, uh, the weights that were used to shift uh, were fixed volumes of ballast water from port to starboard tanks and back again using the, the ballast pumps. Alas, during pumping of water into the number two uh, ballast tank, the crew noticed that the outlet pressure 
on the ballast pump reached seven bars, which is seven atmospheres, whereas it shouldn't normally go above uh, two and a half. So immediately they stopped the pump and went to investigate. They found that the inner plating of the ballast tank bulged outwards, a rather clear sign of overpressurization. Here you can see the yard has already started cropping out uh, the upper section of the bulged plating. And here's another view of the main deck looking to pour them forward. Now you might be tempted to think that if the plating and stiffeners have only bulged and the tank can still hold water without leaking, is it really necessary to replace it? However, apart from the new owners reasonably not wanting any damage on their new vessel, this inner bulkhead of the ballast tank forms part of the ship's effective structural cross-section, which Roman had shown us before. Um, so yes, having the plating pre-buckled like this grossly reduces its ability to support compressive loads, and therefore the ship will have lost a lot, some of its strength to withstand, to withstand wave loads. So the bulge plating and distorted internals have to be replaced. Some more views here. Um, so this shows the inside of the tank looking upwards, where we can confirm that the internal stiffers have bowed outwards as well. And another clearer view showing the bulging outwards of the plate um, on the tank inner sides. So the question is, what has gone wrong? Well, the yard quickly got to work checking the various pipelines and actually found that two non-return ventilation valves from the affected tank <clears throat> had been installed the wrong way around. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, so some quick questions um, regarding clarity of the drawing and construction quality assurance checking. I understand that further checks throughout the ship revealed that another six of these non-return valves have been installed the wrong way around. Anyway, undoubtedly a good lesson learned by the yard and all concerned. Um, so here's some more of the distorted plating and stiffeners cropped out and lying on the key side. And here we see the plating uh, plus uh, stiffeners installed, just needing a bit of paint to be applied. <clears throat> and not a massive cost, uh, just about $250,000 and efficiently, efficiently re rectified by the yard. No one would have wanted any delays so close to the completion and the handover dates. <clears throat> so this one's a rather curious case, now involving another vessel under construction, this time a cutter suction dredger. The problem here involves exten extensive corrosion being found inside one of the new engines. As by the way, before describing the damage found, uh, here's a nice model of how a dredger works. Um, the unit moves itself incrementally forwards using the walking spots, which are this um, arrangement at the stern in conjunction with swinging action of the dredger pivoting on a single spot to achieve the swing. So this will swing sideways. Um, to achieve the swing, the cutting head pulls itself and the rest of the dredger sideways between a pair of redeployable anchors to the sides of the channel to be dredged. In the model, you can see how the cutting head cuts a series of arcs in a channel as it swings and steps forwards. There is a suction pump as well that takes in all the spoil from the cutting head uh, via pipework and leads, e leads it either into an adjacent bar barge or directly ashore. Anyway, back to the case. Uh, the two main engines of the dredger had been installed in the engine compartment on the main deck last August, having been received by the shipyard a few months before. Prior to commencing the commission of the engines in mid-February this year, the commission, um, an inspector was carrying, carried out a service engineer from the manufacturers who found that rust stains were at the bottom of the cylinder liners when inspecting the crankcase. This raised some considerable concerns. Further inspections was conducted and the inspection covered located on the turbochargers and the um, engine air let manifold. And this revealed the presence of very heavy rust staining. A borescope inspection through the injection pockets was then carried out and led by the engineer manufacturer's representative. It was reported that the major engine component had suffered heavy corrosion damage. 
I've just got a few photos so far of the pipework and the internals of the turbocharger, but I understand that the problem extends to all cylinder liners, injectors, cylinder heads, and inlet and outlet valves, valves as well. It looks like all these components will have to be completely replaced and that the manufacturer service team will have to attend to carry out the work and hence higher costs in the region of about $1 million are anticipated. We are awaiting for further engine dismantling to be carried out, though this is still estimate my change. The burning question, of course, is how did this happen? Investigations are ongoing to try to pinpoint where water or moisture could have gotten in. Was it rainwater or seawater? Was it during shipment um, to the yard or during the time that the engines were stored? Or when they were installed on board and waiting for activation? You can see from the bottom left of the image that there must have been some enough moisture for the flow to have formed. So just here. Uh, next, we have this 22-year-old 90-ton bullet pool tuck that was towing a barge between the ports of the Caribbean when at 11 o'clock one morning, a loud noise was heard coming from the engine room. The captain saw smoke coming from the exhaust of the starboard main engine and pulled back on the throttle and then took the engine out of gear. Meanwhile, the first and second engineers were making haste to the engine room where they found thick smoke and oil around both main engines. Initially, they found the source of the problem was the port main engine, so they shut that down, only then to discover a hole in the side of the crankcase of the starboard engine, so they shut this down as well. On closer inspection, the port engine engineer, um, sorry, the port engine was actually unaffected, so they were able to restart the vessel um, and head back home. Um, then they just towed the barge back to the back to port and set off to their home, pay, home base on the Gulf of Mexico to carry out repairs. Five days after the incident, the tug was back home and investigations revealed that it would take about a month and $400,000 to put things right. The engine is a 16-cylinder V-type with two pistons driving each of the eight crank pins of the crankshaft. Failure had occurred in the way of the number eight uh, cylinder unit, and here you can see the various broken and failed components lying on the bottom of the crankshaft case. The scoring on the crank pin was rendered the crankshaft unrepairable, and the liners, conrods, and lower end bearings housings have been broken into pieces. These are also several dents internally to the engine casing, some of which you can see here. In V-ship engines, the two conrods slot uh, together over their shared crank pin in a knife or blade and two prolonged fork arrangement. Our surveyor reports that, most unusually, the fork rod has fractured and split longitudinally. He had never seen this before. The crack surface showed beach marks that would suggest fatigue cracks growth over time. Further metallurgical analysis may reveal the crack initiation site and the time span of the crack growth. An inter interesting wrinkle uh, to the story is that over the last few months, the starboard engine had been experiencing, experiencing higher levels of vibration than normally uh, you would that you would normally expect on an engine, which is where this failure eventually occurred. But the funny thing is that owners had carried out several inspections, including sending divers down to look at the propeller and outer shafts and seals, and to check the shaft alignment, but with no obvious problems having been found. So from the benefit of hindsight and being in this room, it would be too easy, but probably unfair to say that they should have looked harder. Uh, this beautiful ancient three-mast schooner was pro has problems with the bottom structure, but actually it's uh, not that old and was only built in 2004 as a rather distinctive and eye-catching super yacht. She has an aluminum hull and superstructure and is presently undergoing an extensive interior refit in a European yard. The work is expected to be completed in 2024. Since being lifted out of the water at the end of last year, however, the shipyard have found deformations in way of the transverse frames, the bottom longitudinals and longitudinal girders in several of the double bottom tanks. 
The damage isn't particularly dramatic and seems to have occurred predominantly in areas near the lighting holes, where the openings have not been strengthened by the addition of stiffeners at the top and bottom, as we can see here. So there should be. Um, I understand this stiffener, like, so this stiffener here was added, um, was not included in the original construction um, and was added later once the yacht was built. Not very clear, these images, but here you can see just about uh, some of the distortions that have been found where such stiffeners have not been added. There are a lot of areas like this that need to be straightened or cropped and stiffeners added. As to why this has happened, and why some areas of structures have been stiff, uh, stiffened since construction is still under investigation. Was the latest damage caused by lifting the yacht out of the water using the cranes and slings rather than by dry docking or a cycro lift? Or has this, has this been done in the past? Or is it an older damage? So um, does it have anything to do with the present docking arrangement, which supports the hull by bearing on the sides of the keel rather, by, rather than along the keel itself, as we can see here on the right? So you can see this one, and this is not the same. I survey you noted that this is in contrast with the original docking plan on the left, where we can see the main supports being through keel blocks. In view of the supports now being in line with the propeller shaft, the shaft might have been withdrawn for inspection. Oi. Oh no. Oh, I think I pressed the last slide. Well, it's a little overview of what's to come. <laughs> oh, wow. Here we are. Uh, yeah, so back back to the slides. Um, so this one was just done. And so far, the port and, shower, uh, and starboard shafts intermediate bearings have been found to be worn out, although that would not be um, as a result of the docking at least. Further checks um, need to be done to see the alignment and the straightness of the shafts that, um, and the results are still to be a uh, wait. An estimated cost of $650,000 are therefore preliminary only. Uh, but some good news, though, uh, is that the lovely topside coating that has, uh, hasn't has been compromised by the sling procedure. So no need to refit that. All right, moving on, we have a similar level uh, of potential cost for fire damage to this passenger ferry operating between ports in Europe. The vessel has just left harbour at about half past five one evening when a fire occurred in way of the main electrical switchboard located in the engine control room. It is understood that in the time of the incident, the number one generator, generator was undergoing tests related to the problem with load sharing. Reportedly, the generator appeared to be uh, to overspeed, causing an increase in the frequency and a spike in power. This in turn ap appears to have caused a flash over from the switchboard into the surrounding area of the engine control room. The resultant heat and fire also caused damage to the switchboard panel number two generator and the bus tie cabinet adjacent to number one panel. The good news is that the fire was extinguished rapidly by the ship's crew using a portable CO2 extinguisher. The bad news is that the incident resulted in the loss of electrical power and propulsion. All they could do was drop the port anchors and wait assistance. A suitable tug was engaged and arrived close to midnight with no, um, with no power on board. However, they had to disconnect the anchor chain and the bitter end of the drop, and the bitter end, and drop the whole thing into the sea. Albeit, they marked it with buoys for later recovery. They were then towed back to the departure port, and were um, back alongside at just three the next morning. The, repairs, the repair costs indicate here does not include tugs and towage costs or anchorage recover. I understand that the owners are actually a bit upset that the port is trying to charge rather high rates for harbor tug assistance, including a tug that they insisted remained alongside for two days until shipboard power was restored. Okay, the next one is this poor Handy Max bull carrier suffering 
a bit of a nightmare at an African port where she had been birthed. So she was portside uh, to discharge her cargo of fertilizer. The area experienced sudden ex uh, the area experienced a sudden unexpected heavy weather conditions of force eight wind and heavy rain near midnight one night, which allegedly caused the off the off spring line to break. This in turn caused the vessel to surge forward onto the berth, and the master, who was concerned that his bulbous bow would make contact with the vessel berth ahead of him, uh, he tried to, to call for a tug to assist, but ha it hadn't arrived. So he attempted to maneuver away from the berth using his engine and by control of the, of the remaining mooring lines with his intention to ride out the storm at an anchorage point. But things did not go entirely to plan. Alas, the ship ended up hitting the quayside and four other moored vessels in the process. The hull was breached and dented in several locations on the port side fortunately above the waterline. The next evening, she was able to return to the berth to complete discharge and carry out some temporary, temporary repair work before being allowed to sail to the repair port. Uh, we can see here now alongside at the repair yard where they have started to crop out some of the damaged steel. Some other scrapes and dents are still visible. Here's a photo of the breach in the number two hold that was taken at the discharge port before the discharge was actually completed. And here's a doubler plate that was welded over the same breach as a temporary repair. This now has uh, to be removed and properly repaired. More views of the temporary repairs, including cement boxes, which, has, which also have to be removed for permanent repairs. And here, two further casualties of the incident. One on the left, um, the remains of the ship's gangway that got crushed. And on the right, the boom of the number one crane that is visibly dented and now needs checking and refurbishment of the whole unit. Finally, we have another bigger Panamax sized bulker that has also suffered from contact damage, but this time below the waterline and with no particularly incident that has I, ha, that has been identified or admitted to uh, to link this with. The story is that the vessel arrived in the ballast at the Anchorage port in the Americas and was at anchor, awaiting loading instructions. From a regular tank soundings, a water level change in the number four ballast tank on the starboard side was detected. The crew went down to inspect, inspect the tank and found indentations on the hull plating and stiffeners between the frames 78 and 93, plus water sprayings in through the, the a horizontal crack in the shell plating in a way of this damage. Uh, here's the location of the damage, uh, which is marked up on the ship's general arrangement. So they actually sent divers down to locate the crack and drilled holes um, at the end just to stop the crack pro propagating any further. They, they then welded a steel patch over the crack externally to stop the ingress and to facilitate further temporary treatments of the crack from the inside. This um, was all to allow the vessel to continue trading under the con condition of class until a permanent repair could be arranged. This was no later than May this year. Now that the tank is dry, we can see we can have a look at the damaged area and you can see the general setting in extending over the three main transverse frames. And here's the location of the water ingress with a faint white chalk mark pointing to where the crack is. Uh, don't know if you can see, but it's, this is. Uh, closer in and you can see the damage to the vertical frame. And this next stage uh, of the temporary repair was to crop out the web frame and side shell longitudinally in the way of the crack. Then the crack was uh, gorged out in preparation for being filled by the welding. Know the two drill holes here, uh, which were made by the divers to stop the, per the crack from propagating. These are now sealed, of course, by the outer patch. And here we see the area now filled with welding that was tested to ensure no flaws. 
Finally, the web frame and the side longitudinals were reinstalled, but deliberately left unattached in a way of the temporary repair crack area. Um, then the temporary repairs are almost complete now. And here we have the view of the interim repairs to the other distorted web frames. And finally, in order to carry out uh, those repairs in the tank and to get gear in and out, um, they had to cut a hole in the hopper plating of the tank from the hold. This had to be sealed up again. And here we see the class surveyor doing the final testing of the welds for that access hole. The costs given here are for both the temporary repairs and the final permanent repairs when dry docking can be arranged. Re uh, regarding costs, I understand that the owners are presently investiga investigating previous berthing operations to see if some contact with the quayside can be identified. Contact with another vessel seems to be less likely, A, because it would have been rather obvious, um, and B, because divers did not find any paint scratchings in the vicinity, which would be more consistent with a contact um, with a floating object. Um, and that's, that's it. So thank you everybody for joining us again this month. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both to Roman and Paloma. I think you'll agree um, that was very interesting. We've run over a little bit, but I think worthwhile. Um, just a quick reminder, our next briefing is on the 18th of May, and we, we, we already have the subject. It's LNG and understanding the vessels and their challenges, so I hope you can join us then. Um, it's also the day of the Rugby Seven, the Lloyds Rugby Seven, so we'll start off here, and then we'll all wander out west a little bit later on in the day. Um, again, if... Um, uh, if you get a chance to do the feedback, uh, please do. It really helps us out. Um, and if you want a chance of winning next month's prize draw, um, please uh, make sure that you uh, you do follow up. And we have a winner from last month. Ed Lowe, is he in the room? No, he's not in the room. So he doesn't get the chocolate. He does get the champagne, however, um, which we'll get to him somehow in the next week or so. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you next month. <laughs>